All right. Well, welcome back, everybody, <clears throat> um, to uh, the 14 or Deming's 14 principles. Uh, of course, I've got Corey Pitzer with me from uh, CEO of SafeMap and Malcolm Staves, the VP of Health and Safety for L'Oreal. And today we're going to be discussing <clears throat> Deming's 14th principle, put every everybody in the company to work accomplishing the transformation. And so, Malcolm, you've seen many changes in safety approaching over the last 30 years or so, especially in, in the European context. What, <clears throat> what were they? And do you think the, uh, the principles of Deming's uh, a need to transform is valid for our times? And uh, <clears throat> do we need transformation? Well, that's a loaded question to start off with, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, but I mean, the, 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 the reply, the, the quick reply is absolutely. I mean, from from a culture that was really like from time and motion studies that we had over in Europe where everything was about being more efficient, whereby there was no real value of, of human, uh, of, of for humans, human beings. I mean, we've all seen the people dangling from the top of skyscrapers and so on and so forth to a culture whereby now, you know, uh, we really put people at the center. It's not just about their, uh, their health and safety, it's about their well being. Um, it's also about the whole person, whole life approach. And that has been a transformation in itself huh? and transformation over time. So without a doubt, yes, transformation is important. And just to add, it will be important going forward as well because it was not finished in that transformation. Great, thanks. And uh, what about you, Corey? You've worked uh, mostly in Australia and now uh, past 15 years in, in North America. How do you see global safety seen um, in the context of? Don't forget the uh, uh, 29 years I was in uh, growing up in South Africa and uh, did a, I started my apprenticeship, so to speak, in the mining industry, a very crude environment, uh, but actually quite a sophisticated one um, in many ways. I remember sitting in the training program in uh, in the company that's today BHP, uh, it was Billiton or Gencore, um, sitting in, in, in training programs that were really quite sophisticated and focusing on, you know, the transition from the scientific management of Taylor to a more uh, employee participative model. And this was in the 1982, 83, where this was happening. And uh, uh, so there was already transitions happening in management, in, 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 this, in, this, in the, basically the, the practice of management um, early on. And I think uh, my view is a little bit of safety was a little bit Johnny come lately, um, you know, with the human focus on safety. I think uh, that's already started to happen in the world of Deming, which I really uh, love his uh, concepts, you know, the whole focus on people. Uh, was preceding uh, what is today uh, participative practices in safety or the humans are the solution. Uh, well, I think that's been a, a pretty much a long-standing kind of focus. The other area is the, the shift to critical risks, you know, serious injury, fatal and catastrophic risk, which also I encountered in Australia in, in the uh, 80s, uh, sorry, in the 90s. Uh, quite sophisticated, focusing on the critical risks in the organization with critical controls um, and developing that very, uh, very effectively. And now, of course, that's a bit of a buzzword in North America these days. Um, but even though that, you know, that's also, uh, you know, a transition that, that that's happened. And I think the, um, the, uh, the, the shift into thinking around safety culture, um, you know, has been very prominent in the in the last two decades, I'd say. So that's the kind of shifts and transformations that I've seen. Um, but you know, there's I think there's a lot of hype about new things in safety, which may be just a lot of hype at the moment for me. You know, in some ways. Great point. If if I can add something as well, I think there's also been um, a, a change, a transformation in in the way that we we look at indicators. I mean. I remember when I first start, started uh, working um, in in production, they were talking about zero fatalities, one fatality a year, and all the rest of it. It was very much a focus on fatalities. Then we went into the uh, sort of like the um, the lagging indicators, like lost time rate. Then we went to total incident rate. 
then we now have got more and more into those leading indicators. So I've also seen as a sideline this transformation in the way that we actually look at indicators as well. And just one final point just to add, there's also been a big transformation and it will continue, I believe, as well in what the expectations are of a, of a, of a health and safety leader, what the professional actually looks like, his expertise and what he's expected to do. So that's been a massive transformation, but I'm sure we're going to get into that a little bit later. Mm. Yeah, well, it, and, <clears throat> and Malcolm, you may have jumped ahead and, and uh, started in on the next question, but what's, what's the meaning of, of transformation from, from your perspective? I'll go first on, on that one if you want, uh, Corey. I, I, I sure. think for me, the, the transformation, it's like a transformation of anything. You start with something and you have a view to vision of where you want to be, future objective, and it's how you actually get there by transforming, by changing the organization, the management system, the people to deliver what that future vision uh, looks like. I mean, in very simple terms, that's what I was saying. Corey, feel free to add your stuff to that. Yeah, I, you know, um, uh, change is a, is, is, a, is a really interesting concept, uh, you know, in terms of organizational change or organizational transformation. And um, there's there's been some interesting eras in, in, in management practices, I think, that were real shifts. Um, and to go back to the quality era, um, you know, you remember in the, you, you would have read because uh, Scott, you're too young to remember, but in the, in the, in, in the 70s and 80s of, of uh, you know, when the Japanese uh, quality era started to kick off, there was a big focus on TQM, total quality management. And it was, uh, there was a, a, it was an era that looks like safety today, conferences, gurus, academics, running the show around safety around quality at the time. And, uh, and then the whole, uh, the whole era of, of Deming came forth. And, and, and really what happened was this. He, his work resulted in operational managers taking charge of quality out of the hands of the quality department. They took it and they said, we're going to put this into the process, into the operational process upstream. And the, uh, as such, you know, there's, there's probably four things that need to happen in such a shift transformation. And that the first one is, you know, the, a shift in the definitions of work, how we define work. That, that's the first thing that, we, that we'll see. But more importantly, we'll see new tools, new techniques to, to, to analyze, to, to manage the process. I mean, the, the statistical process control charts, the simple thing. That was a huge shift in the thinking in, in, in that time. So it's new tools. Uh, and then there's a new language, you know, that, 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 that these managers started to, to use, which, uh, which, which resulted in, uh, uh, you know, a significant culture change. That was a, so people from the, the, the following era couldn't understand what the people from the previous year was really on about. And, and that's, that's a shift. That's a transformation. And, uh, you know, my thinking now is, uh, you know, is safety to or safety differently or uh, hop? Do they meet those criteria uh, of what is the transformation? And I don't think it does. I don't know if you could, if, if we can take that as a question, Scott, and I'll, I'll come in just a little bit, if, if you don't mind, with my experience on that, on that area. And I'm going to be uh, very direct based on my 35 years of working in um, health and safety. Um, I, I think all these new ideas, they help move the needle sometimes, but it's always never, nothing new, okay? It's always nothing new. I'm a great believer of the, what I call the original DuPont Bradley curve and driving from a reactive culture through to an, a, an interdependent culture. And when I look at some of these things that come forward that are from the gurus and uh, some external people, it fits onto that Bradley curve, right? But the problem is it's sold sometimes to people and to a, a site or to an industry organization that's not ready for it. Because you really have to know where you are on that culture journey and you in that transformation journey. And you need to be able to apply the right tool at the right time. Otherwise, it'll fail. And trust me, that's my experience. I mean, when I started off, I bought a number of programs off the shelf. 
well-known programs. And within a couple of years, both of them had failed and the sites. And the reason you're told they failed is because you didn't apply exactly the rule or the form, the training that you've had. And that embarked me on a different approach, which is creating the tools for my company that fit the culture of my company. And unfortunately, there's a lot of health and safety professionals out there, and I'm going to be provocative here, that think they can buy off the shelf and it'll solve all the problems, and it just doesn't work. You really do need to have an approach of the right tool at the right time, depending on your maturity within whatever you use as your culture maturity model. And like I said, we use a, um, a hybrid version of uh, the DuPont Bradley curve, which we call the L'Oreal culture curve. So I know that's not a question, but I just wanted to throw that in because it almost came out of what you said there, Corey. So I, I, you know, that I absolutely support that because that is what I define as deep safe. Deep safe happens inside the organization from within the organization based on the principles that you establish. But then you've got to evolve. You've got to evolve your systems. You've got to evolve your tools uh, and processes, especially the processes, to make that happen. And, 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 and the, you can't jump from the outside. I absolutely think that's uh, the, f the failure in so many ways. Well, I totally agree. And, and again, apologies, Scott, but our system starts with risk management. You've got to get your risks under control. Those risks that you can kill somebody have a fatal accident irreversible. And if you haven't got that in place, you shouldn't be looking at anything else, right? That needs to be under control. And then as you transform, you transform into, okay, now it's the EHS taking the lead. So you're starting to put systems in place a little bit more organization and then it's the management taking the lead so you put the management in the driving seat the navigator is more of the ehs function and that takes you to another level of culture maturity development mm -hmm. then as a result of that you get more and more people starting to get involved employee engagement collaboration as well between management ehs and and and, and the line and that cre starts to create a culture of uh, i am my brother's keeper and that then takes you on, on to the next level. And our experience within L'Oreal is to go from the early stages to the later stages is a 10 to 15 year journey. I mean, we've been doing this in L'Oreal now for 14, 15 years. And I, own, I would say we only have a couple of sites globally out of a 572 that I would say were interdependent at that final step. But it's all about, like I said before, right tool at the right time, depending on where you are on that journey. And as a result, the EHS profession, the EHS leaders need to change as well because you need a different person to drive something that's a dependent, interdependent culture than you do a reactive culture. All about transformation, totally aligned with the Demin's principle. Yeah, very much. Now, Scott, you're completely lost, aren't you? Yeah, no, no. I, I was, uh, I was just gonna say, you guys. I knew it'd be an easy interview, and I uh, just uh, asked the first question and get the conversation. <laughs> so, so no problem at all. And I, and I think Malcolm, you, you already touched on it, um, and and feel feel free to add to it. But just L'Oreal's approach to developing a high performing health and safety uh, culture globally, and and uh, again, I think you touched on it, but maybe drill into like how how do you unify it across geographies or, or production processes yeah i mean we're, we're quite um lucky in some respects that we have a very centralized approach to health and safety for example we believe in a, we apply nfpa for fire uh, fire protection and prevention globally we apply the atex explosion rules which are european globally um, we apply other tools that we've developed ourselves globally. So it's every single site. Um, there is room for adapting to local culture. Don't get me wrong. So it's a skeleton that we, what we do. But within that, so that all then fits into this culture journey on our, on our culture curve, as I said, a hybrid of the, uh, the DuPont, uh, DuPont Bradley curve. And depending on where you are on that, it determines what kind of tools you can put in place. So when you're in the risk management mode and we have our life program, which is those activities whereby if not under control can kill somebody and there we're very top down. This is the way it is. You have to comply to the L'Oreal rules. If you don't want to comply to the L'Oreal rules, you need to have an external verified risk assessment to say that what you do manage, manages the risk to the same level. And then we can, we can change the approach at corporate level. Then when we start to transform into driving it by 
by the EHS. We have certain tools that go in place that complement, that drive the risk management to a certain level, getting senior management involved. Then we start to have our what we call our measure program, which is, for want of a, an, an expression, it's almost like a, a management, a leadership, people-based safety program, getting out there on the shop floor, talking about situations at risk, at risk practices, but it's manager and his team. It's creating trust, it's creating conversation and pe collaboration because we resolve things together, management and, and, and line people. And that's across all our sites, whether it's operations, R&I, admin sites. Some are more advanced than others, depending on where, they're, where they are in the culture, okay? And then as we go further, we have programs like our SIO program, uh, Safety Improvements Opportunity, which is where we use the eyes and the ears of people to identify risk before we've even had a first aid case, before we've even had a near miss, right? And we get about 75,000 of those reported a year. We close out 90%, but that creates employee engagement. But because the employee actually presents it, gives it to his boss, and his boss is obliged to close that item, not as an expert, but as a project manager, so he can pull people in to help him. And he closes that out. It creates collaboration, relationship, employee engagement. It's visible felt leadership. And that's fundamental on transforming our culture from driven by line management to getting more and more people involved, but still maintaining the visibility. And then as we go further, further down, we have other tools that help develop, and I am my brother's keeper, um, people would even nowadays would call it psychological safety, whereby we actually can develop a culture whereby people can, they see something and they can go talk to anybody, no matter where they are in the organization and say, look, I'm sorry, Scott, I see you're doing something. I know you're my boss's boss, but I'm worried about your safety. Can we have a conversation about what you're doing? And that is a program that we call Constructive Challenge. And it's quite advanced, but everybody's taught about um, healthy conflict management and how to deal with it. And sometimes because you've got a program called Constructive Challenge, you're less likely, Scott, when I come to challenge you to tell me where to go because you know there is this program. I mean, people now call that psychological safety, but some respects it is psychological safety, as is that program SIO, whereby we're wanting people to report things, opportunities for improvement, things they see are wrong. So that's basically how it works. And what we do is each site evaluates themselves where they are on that journey, which identifies what tools they should be focusing on. And we have a culture audit that is geared at reviewing the pro that process for all our sites, which is every three years. And uh, the sites, then we verify whether they are where they think they are or not. And as a result, we may adjust the kind of tools that they're putting in place. Because the idea is, we need the tools to be a success. We don't want the tools to be a waste of time and effort for management or the EHS professional because it's going to fail. So, it, it, so that's the way we drive it. And it works for us, but it may not work for somebody else. So, so that's it. In, in, I'm not in a nutshell, but it's quite a complicated system, but it works for us. Yeah, great. Well, thank you so much for that. And I mean, Corey, you've worked with companies around the world and, and uh, how... Uh, how do you know you've accomplished a transformation and, and uh, you know, what, what's the best example you could provide of a transformed company? Um, I, uh, I, I was asked uh, once that question uh, because, you know, our consulting is in transformation. Um, I was asked this question by an HR executive. How would we know that we've transformed? And um, and I and I was a little bit stumped by the question uh, at the time, but I think I came up with a really nice answer. <laughs> I got out of it, and here here was my answer: um, If you believe or think that you've accomplished transformation, that you've arrived, you most certainly have not arrived. You most certainly have arrived at the wrong place. If you have this illusion that, oh, okay, we transformed now. Because inherent in the word transform is it is an it is a, a non-starting, non-ending process. You know, it is you, you will not accomplish, you will see markers. Um, and the Bradley curve is a is, is a is a marker process that you can classify and see, okay, we've 
we've shifted generally from this paradigm to that paradigm. Uh, but like all, you know, in 10, 20 years time from now, there's going to be a new uh, paradigm in front of the Bradley curve or the Hudson model or whatever. We're starting to work on that kind of thinking. What would be the next level of marker um, to, to, uh, to, to, to identify that? So you won't know uh, really in those uh, quantitative terms, you'll know in a qualitative way. But if you look at the, the overall shift in, um, in, in, in injury rates, I mean, in safety, what do we measure? We measure accidents, you know, it's a, uh, it is a stock trade kind of thing. But my, my question about that is always, um, is there a real connection, a real connection between, especially in modern days, between the incidents we have and the actual risks in our organization? Uh, and uh, Malcolm used the, the, the sentence there in the beginning, which is, I think, extremely important. You have to start with your risks. No matter what you do, you, this is the primary focus in safety. It's not about safety, it's about risks. And uh, more I, the more I engage in this, uh, in this field, uh, the more I think that what we see in terms of risk uh, never, will never show in stats. And, and, and I think I've mentioned to you, Scott, before that I've spent two years on the road with a, with a big uh, a UK company, mining company around the world, and visited 42 sites that they have and on this program called Elimination of Fatalities. And, um, and what we've seen on the ground in a company that was and is extremely safe in terms of its metrics, its leading organization, Yet we've seen this swamp of risks hanging around in the organization that uh, just needs coincidence uh, for it to become a fatal accident. And that was an enormous learning for, for me and for the organization to, you know, we, 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 we are very deep in our organization. There's almost another layer of performance of risk, if I can call it that, or dynamics of risk that we don't quite understand. We, you know, if we have an accident, say, uh, every four years, uh, we have a, a look at our rates, you know, and, oh, this, four years ago, we were there, now we were here. Is that, is that indicative of where we were and where we are now? So, um, so one of the things, maybe just interesting, one of the things, coming back to the uh, maturity, um, I've, I, I found some very simple tools, it's a very simple metrics almost. And here's just one of them. Um, I call it the ratio of hideable versus non-hideable uh, uh, hazard reports or risk reports. If, the, if a person uh, has no option but to report the incident because it's an incident, it's a near miss, there was damage or people witnessed this, that's what I call a, a, a non-hideable. But if there was something that happened, only this person knows about, for instance, if that person kept quiet, they could have easily not reported, no one would have been any better. So what I found in this two years program process was if you have four, uh, sorry, five uh, hideable risks reported for every non-hideable, you're, you're at the front end of that maturity curve. So if I look at a company now, look at their, their risk reports and say, okay, let's have a look at the risk reports and they make a, a, just a judgment call. Could this have been hidden? And if most of them could not be hidden, then you're not really at that mature level. And, and so there's one way of, okay, we, we've started to move up the curve. We've started to move to the front end of the maturity. And, uh, and, and that's, that, that, that is so, um, uh, that's digging deep in the organization. This is now digging into uh, risk uh, transparency in the organization. This is digging into, uh, I feel free, psychologically safe, to report things that I could have hidden um, uh, if, if, I, if I wanted to. No, I'm not doing that now. I'm reporting this. That's maturity on that higher end marker. So to me, uh, have you accomplished uh, these would be indicators of such uh, accomplishments, uh, you know, of you being, of you accomplishing, if I could put it like that. 
Um, your second question there was, uh, uh, what is the best example you have of transformed, comp transformed companies? Um, the, the, there's really two that, that I've been working with in the last few years that really stands out for me. Um, and um, the one is a construction company. Now, if you know the construction business like, like I do, having worked as a, as a, as a laborer in a construction company, um, it's, it, you know, a, a construction worker is a very smart, agile kind of employee. Um, and they, they, they know exactly what to say and what not to say to the client because the client requires this and, you know, okay, you want me to fill in this form? I'll fill in 10 if you want them, you know? And, um, and, and this is, this is a, a very tough business. And the company is actually, and hopefully I, we could have him as a guest at some point, is the construction division, if I could call it that, of Southern Company. And the manager, the, the VP there is a guy with the name of Robin Hurst, who he's the client that uses subcontractors. And so normally what would happen is they would hide everything away from the client so that they can get the job, so that they get the contract done, you know, and, and, and they do they have a safety record that, that's second to none. Everybody's got a safety record that's second to none. He's opened this up. And he said, I don't want you to pretend to me what your safety record is. I really want to know what your risks are. And that was, uh, that's such a, a game changer in that environment. And, you know, to see that construction company dealing with us in this very progressive way. So they've done a couple of things. One is they've integrated safety much deeper into operational management. They've created this risk transparency um, and they've actually generated themselves or, or moved themselves into this next level uh, beyond the Hudson model, which is say the highest level is uh, what's generative. Uh, I like to call this uh, the regenerative uh, level. Uh, and it's, it's an example of a company that's there. Uh, and uh, the second company is Deb Marine. And I, I, I've spoken with you before about them, who mine uh, diamonds from the seabed. And, um, and it's incredibly risky operations. Uh, they, the ships have got mining uh, vacuum pumps underneath it, a processing plant on top of it, uh, 120 people living on the ship for 28 days. Uh, and they've got helicopters in and out, very, very complicated, uh, uh, high-risk environment. And they've been able to, to create this, this uh, functional uh, process of, um, of uh, talking about the things that, that, that uh, Malcolm just mentioned. How do they really get their employees involved? And, uh, and they've done that with exceedingly good process of, uh, of getting people to report things that they could previously have been hidden. And now it's transparent in the organization and, and, and they're really making that work. So it's possible in an organization that is, you know, as risky as construction, as, uh, as uh, um, you know, dynamic and uh, uh, changing as a construction environment, as well as this high-risk environment, uh, like it's, it's typically... Uh, something that, uh, you know, you can almost compare with uh, with the aircraft carrier uh, deck. You know, they should have lots of accidents, yet they don't. And so what is it that they do? They, they, they focus on their risk. And, and that is, it, it sounds obvious, but I think a lot of people, you know, risk is the last thing they think of because they've got all these systems to comply with and all the paperwork to do and all this bureaucracy. Uh, but the majority of effort is not on their risks. Yeah, it's interesting you should say that because we've often had the debate that we're not really creating in L'Oreal um, a health, safety, and well-being culture. Part of what we're creating is a risk searching culture. And as yes. you go further down, you transfer from top-down approach to risk to helping educating employees wherever they are, and maybe even their families to see and understand risk themselves. Right. And as soon as somebody can see the risk and associate with the risk, right, then they may react to that risk and protect themselves. So put the control measures in place, whether they're at home doing DIY or whether or whether they're at work. So I think that whole journey is all about developing a risk 
searching culture because managers can't be there all the time. People don't follow roles all the time. So somehow you've got to change the way people are wired through a journey of discovery, um, through curiosity, through learning, so that people see the risk themselves. Not forgetting, you know, going back to what I said, our life program where we can have fatal accidents. Yeah, you've got to put the engineering and, and all the rest of it in. But I, I think, you know, depending on where you are on that journey, part of it is teaching people to see risks for themselves and to react accordingly because we can't always be there for them. Right. If I can, if, if, uh, Malcolm is triggering me now. <laughs> this is, to me, a really important point. Uh, I'm always almost at a point where I'm saying uh, there, is, there is a safety culture in an organization and there's a risk culture. And if you measure a safety culture, you measure the things you do to be safe. You, in other words, you, you measure... Uh, our safety systems, you measure people's perception of how, how the quality of meetings, uh, you know, you measure the superficial stuff. But if you, if you measure the risk culture, you're measuring people's perceptions about their risks, how they engage with them, and what influences them, uh, either in terms of team processes or job factors, to take risks, to take shortcuts um, in the workplace. That is a risk culture. It is really somewhat different from the safety culture in the organization. And then my, uh, my definition of safe in an organization is the readiness to respond to risk. And each one of those three, readiness, response, and risk, are, are entities that are measurable, either through perception surveys or metrics themselves, um, but they also have a range of processes to create that. And the, the, the one that I just mentioned about Deb Marine, um, they, they, they have a process to create that readiness to respond to risk. So we, we, we really have to, uh, you know, I'm almost, almost thinking, should we really be called safety professionals? You know, should we not be called something in the risk field uh, with a risk label? so that we can actually shift that. Uh, when I was appointed in my first um, job as in safety in, 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 in the company Gencore, um, I insisted at the time that I don't want to be called a group safety manager. I was called a group risk manager. And, um, and, and, and it was like, it, that's, a, that's, a, that's a shift in thinking that almost starts with what you think your job is, you know, and that's what I think the safety profession, in a way, should be thinking about. Sorry, Scott, I'm, I, yeah, we, no. I, we both are running around like the, the headless uh, chicken here. <laughs> that's all right. That's uh, that's the good thing about getting great minds together and and the ideas and the cover cover uh, conversation. Sorry that it uh, that it spurs. So because and and Malcolm circled back around. I was just gonna I was just gonna add that. Uh, you know, his earlier uh, description of, of the high performance health and safety culture at, at L'Oreal sounds very, very similar to what you described, Corey, with, with Deb Marine and, and Southern co uh, Company. So I was just going to make that point, but Malcolm helped bring it, bring it home. So, Thank you. Um, but, uh, but Malcolm, you're widely known for the hummingbird approach. Can you, can you <laughs> describe what that is and uh, tell us how it relates to, uh, to health and safety? Yeah, I mean, uh, very, very quickly, um, it's, uh, I believe, an American Indian fable. And it's all about a forest fire. All the animals run out, out, of the, uh, out of the forest. The hummingbird, when it flies out, it goes to a local river, takes up a little bit of water and goes backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, trying to put out a fire. And eventually, some of the other animals actually turn around and say, hey, you know, what are you doing? You're so small, you're making no impact, you're making no difference at all. And the hummingbird quite simply says, well, I'm doing the best I can. And if every single one of us does a little bit and contributes, then maybe we'll just make a difference and put out the fire. And how that translates into L'Oreal is we say that if 85,000 employees do a little bit for health and safety, for well-being, for the environment every single day, just a little bit, that's a lot. That's a lot together. And if we all, as human beings, do a little bit every day, uh, whether it's holding the door open for somebody, seeing something that's a potential danger, so we, we deal with it there in the, in the here and now, rather than walking away, 
then that makes a big difference. And so it's all, and in that sense, it's all about individuals making a difference. But when it comes to culture transformation, we also believe that that has to be done by step by step with the right tool, as I've said before, the right tool at the right time, depending on where you are. It's not trying to go too far too soon because it'll fail. It's those little steps, those little, and it's all about marginal gains as well. That's what the hummingbird is about. So it's my mantra. It's what I live by. Um, my hashtag is hashtag be the hummingbird on, on LinkedIn. And it is throughout L'Oreal. It is, it is the way that we drive health, safety, and well-being. And every single step we take, we make sure we do it well or to the best of our abilities. And then we move forward. That's great. So, thank um, you. How do you, how do you measure success and, and failure in, in that situation in order to, to measure, uh, you know, what transformation has been achieved or, or maybe not achieved? The, the only way, the primary way we do it is through our, uh, what we call our culture audit program. So we assess where the, the transformation is in its progress. Is it in dependent, independent, interdependent? Where, where, it, where is it in, 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 in that process? That's for the organization. Um, we've just defined what future fit means for our health and safety professionals and that we're in, in line to try and transform our professionals so that we're more of more visionary, better coaches, um, better communication management skills, the leadership aspects, the softer power skills, as you may say, not l losing the, the technical skills as well. So we, we're also creeping along with that as well. And we don't measure it by the outputs. And this is going to sound really, really crazy, but we measure it because it feels right. When we do a culture audit and we see employees are getting involved, they're stopping, they're making corrections, right? Managers are talking and collaborating with employees to make a difference and take it to the next steps. It just feels right. And I know that sounds very soft and whatever, but there is no hard metrics here. There is just what we like to say. We call them heart metrics. So leading by the heart. Mm. It sounds a little bit soft, but that's no, the way that's, it is. Uh, that's great. <clears throat> I love it. Um, Corey, you kind of, I think you sort of touched on it in <clears throat> your previous example, but um, you use the term latent and lurking, you know, metrics. You know, what are they? What do they tell you? And, and uh, can you provide a few examples? Yeah. Um, so when I did this uh, uh, program for this mining company, uh, Elimination of Fatalities, um, it was, a, it was a, an eye-opener in many respects. But what we observed is that, and we did a, uh, so here's how we did it. We, we would engage, we were a team of about 10 to 12 people. Um, and we would start the day, start the week on site with talking to the management. They show us all the PowerPoints and slides and so on. But then straight up after that, we walk straight out into the workplaces and we engage with employees and supervisors at the front end and really start to uh, uh, identify with them what are the risks that they face and also uh, from their perspective, what is the what is that maturity of the organization? And so we had a little questionnaire that we would not have a questionnaire with them, but we would ask them a range of questions. And in the evening, we would go and code what we have heard during the day. And so we, we, we identified really three levels of organizations in maturity. So reactive, rational, and resilient, just the terms we, we use for them. But, um, but basically... Uh, and, and we've engaged with, I think, 12,000 12, people in, this, in, this, in, in, in that uh, two-year period. Um, so from that, um, I developed some metrics, indicators rather than metrics. And it is uh, based, and, and it's based on that three levels of maturity. And so what I've done was to use uh, ships as the, as the symbol of each of the levels of the organization. So uh, the, the system one organization is the, is the massive cargo ship uh, where safety and risk management is slow, deliberate, meticulous. There's enough time to react, uh, but the organization is at the lower end of maturity. So at a, at a reactive level. Um, then the, the second one is 
The second level, system two, is not a progression from one. It is a the failure of, of, of progression almost. And that is the typical ship that I'm using there is the Titanic and the Concordia, the cruise ship that, uh, that suffers from the delusion that it is safe. So this is where the black swan concept of uh, Nassim and Talib are used. But there's another uh, French, uh, another financial uh, researcher with the name of Didier Sonnet, who created the concept of dragon kings. Basically, dragon kings are black swan events, but, they, but there's an element of predictability in them. So black swan is you can't predict it, it's just going to happen. Uh, the uh, uh, dragon king is no, there's indicators that can tell you what is what what is possibly happening so i just saw uh, black swans with purple dragons uh, you, i'm not sure if you heard me talking about that before um so there are three so the questionnaire it's got 14 uh, 14 indicators in so we send this questionnaire into the organization a random selection of people from different levels a stratified sample and they, they, they make a selection on three choices each time for the 14 uh, indicators. And from that, we calculate uh, what is the organization's uh, uh, level in terms of system one, two, and three. So, uh, so just three, to give you an th idea of three, uh, three of these. Uh, one is, uh, what is the level of risk, uh, risk system skepticism? In the organization so the one the question one option one they have to ask answer is uh is your organization like this uh the risk system is poorly designed and ineffective or slow to react that's system one or is your organization our risk system prevents most incidents and accidents uh that's system two because that's delusional that your risk system is going to prevent everything but you don't know that when you answer the question so system three is we know we have gaps and are constantly looking for them. So if they make the selection, we have a little algorithm that calculates what is the level of exposure? Uh, is it either merging, escalating, or extensive in terms of uh, serious risk exposure? Or if they have more a system three organization, is it reduced, receding, or retained? So that's one example of a, a, a latent indicator. So if you know where you are in this organization on this, then you are getting that early warning signal almost. Um, another one, I'll just do one more of uh, what, what is the approach or what is the tendency of employees when they comply to rules? Um, system one, they privately bend or ignore rules to get things done. System two, they tend to readily comply with all rules. Or three, they have no fear to often challenge safety rules. Now, there you go into the organization that's more agile, more uh, focused on, on constantly shifting and transforming. So those are, those are indicators of what I call uh, latent indicators that can tell you if, you if you work out, you know, calculate your whole organization uh, on the 14 indicators. Those are related to what I mentioned earlier about the hideability or non-hideability of, of, of incidents, of, of, of risk reports. So we're now in the cultural level of thinking. You know, we're not, uh, we're not uh, waiting for things to happen. We're really upstream in the organization and measuring, uh, measuring there. So that's, that's, the, that's the approach that we follow. And we've, uh, we, we really just started to deploy this with organizations. So we, we've been developing this for like a year and a half now. And, um, and so we've got thousands of people that participate in this by now. But now we're starting to, to make this available to our clients that we have already, you know. So that's, that's the, that's the uh, process that we follow. If I, can, if I can add something to that as well, just from my own experience within L'Oreal, we don't have that, that kind of model. The model is a little bit like we have confidence in the journey. The journey for us is our uh, maturity curve. And for each of the programs we have, when we design for a risk culture, for, for safety culture. So what I mean by that is we look at what is the role of the management and the leadership? What is the role of the employee? Because we want employee engagement. What is, the, what is the role of the EHS professional? And for each individual little program, 
what is the KPI that drives that to success? So for the measure program, for example, which is our, uh, our people-based safety program for line managers, which starts, which starts with the mancom and then they train the people down to supervisor. What is the, the, the leading KPI that we have there is the number of at-risk conditions to the number of uh, at-risk practices identified. We also track the number of action items that come out of the visit. We impose only a 90% closure. That's the objective, right? Because that creates visible leadership, employee engagement, and whatever. So we have confidence, though, that that drives the measure, this particular program. And we do the same for the others. And we believe that if we drive the individual programs with the right metrics and we have the right programs in place at the right time, that the output is the culture. Right, so we then measure the culture, the, where we are on the culture journey or the risk culture journey, and the output is the lagging indicators. Okay, now that's so the output of we don't manage lost time rates or total incident rate; they just happen because we have confidence in the programs that we have in place and how we manage and drive those individual programs and how they've been designed. It's a, it's a similar but a slightly different, and that we've we've got in place in L'Oreal and. I'm going to be very open and honest. I've put in place in now four different companies, construction, and I've worked in construction, heavy chemicals, metal, uh, packaging, and now cosmetics. And the results have been very, very similar. But the most important thing behind it as well, going back to what we spoke about at the beginning, is all of these programs are homegrown, developed, in this case, developed by L'Oreal, for L'Oreal. We bring in expertise from external to help us. We take a bit of, we steal pr with pride from some of the programs that are out there, but it's adapted to our program and it's developed by our people with the right kind of KPIs. And it just drives us to the same place as uh, what, what, what Corey was taking. And it, that comes from 30 years of actually being at the head of, of, of a number of, of companies when it comes to health and safety. So mm -hmm. just wanted to throw that in. Yeah, great. And I, and I think you you touched on it already, Malcolm, but the going back to Deming's principle, like what, what does put everyone to work really mean and, and who is everyone? Uh, and and what, what about those people that might be out in remote or small locations or lone workers? Like how, how do you uh, how do you include them in that uh, that transformation? I mean, the ultimate goal of the transformation for us is and this is utopia, okay? I'm, we're not there, we've got a long way to go, but we wanna transform every individual into a, a health and safety leader, right? Everybody to take control of their own health and safety in the situation, whether in the field, when they're faced with a situation in a manufacturing plant. But to get there, you need to de develop that culture. It doesn't happen because you say, tomorrow you will be responsible and you will see every risk that there is around you and you will react properly. It just doesn't happen. We're all, we're all on, the, on a journey of personal cult, uh, cult, culture development. So I actually, at the end of the day, think it's all about that. It's all about finding what pushes the button because I know people that are maybe operators, associates, et cetera. They are leaders in the local community. So we all have that leadership potential. So how do we push and find that right bush button to push to get them to be that leader that we want, not only for themselves, but looking after people around them at work. And I think that's the role of the health and safety professional. And that's the role of what we, what we put in place It's to get to that state. And then I think, I think we'll still have accidents. I think risk will not go away, but that's where we need to get to. Corey, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think the, uh, you know, um, it's almost um, a, a cultural shift in organization uh, starts to grow on itself and in itself. You know, it is as you, uh, as you start with this transformation uh, and at first there's this focus on the operational risk. That's where we have accidents, you know. Um, but uh, just an interesting story from my side about this was uh, I was introducing leadership training, deep safe leadership training courses in a mining company uh, that was based here in Vancouver. And uh, we uh, had people that was in the finance department starting to attend the, the program. 
and the the financial the, the the CFO send emails to the COO. Why do we have to do this? Uh, we are not in the line of fire, you know. My people sit in an office all day, and he constantly uh, encourages the COO COO constantly encourage the guys to uh, to to attend, uh, and eventually. Uh, he came to attend. And when he came to attend and saw the experience that these others had, and he, he so enjoyed the program, he became like a real disciple for deep, safe leadership. And the think about that, you know, the CFO going to the mine site suddenly talks about safety, wants to go out and, uh, and, and do some, some engagement with people in the field. But he's a CFO. That sends a huge message, you know, in terms of uh, the embracing of the culture in the organization. Um, fortunately, later on, this, C this CFO became the CEO. Uh, and can you imagine then his uh, body in his understanding of what is really happening on, uh, in the organization and how he was, uh, he was um, uh, viewed by people in the organization because he's not this guy that sits in an office in Vancouver and never see the real world. So that's the kind of thing that, you know, what, what I mean with the, uh, the, the culture starts to grow on itself um, if, you, if, you, if you have the, the, the PowerPoints in the organization right. Well, you guys have uh, gone off script a few times, so I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna take a turn and, and go off script and throw you a curveball here. <clears throat> so, I mean, we're talking about, you know, L'Oreal, 85,000 employees, Southern, Southern company, B, BHP, you know, huge organizations. What, what a lot of safety professionals are out there in a lot smaller organizations with smaller teams. What, what kind of advice can you provide to, to them as, as far as, as, you know, how, how, how they could go about, um, you know, getting everyone involved in, in that, uh, in that risk uh, transformation or, or a safety culture transformation? Who do you want to go for? I'll go first. Yeah, Malcolm. Malcolm. Go for it, Cole. Yeah, Malcolm, <laughs> why don't you take that one? And, and, and then I'm going to steal something from Malcolm so he can't say it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and this is what Malcolm said. Um, you cannot, there's no cookie cutter right. uh, approach to this kind of thing. Every organization has to start understanding their people, have to understand their processes, have to understand their risks and have to evolve this kind of transformation from within. And uh, it, it may lead them in different directions, but there, there, there's broad philosophies, you know, sure, there's broad philosophies of what's happening in the world of safety and risk management and so on. But if you, if you have this, uh, for me, the most important thing is the focus on the real people. Now, this, this may not sound right, the real people in the organization are the people who do the real work, the line management, the people who deliver the processes, who manage the process that where the risk happens, you know, those are the people, if they're not involved, and, and, and I call this a two-speed safety management system in the organization. What I've seen very often is the safety message comes from corporate and it hits the site. It hits the manager, the top team. They're involved. They are engaged. They, they do it. Then from there, it splits into two. The safety message then goes directly to the worker, the front line, via the safety department, the safety function, the communications, the posters on the wall, the system. While the line management, the middle manager, is almost, in some cases, left free to look after production. And then that, that evolves. And so the line, the line manager, he or she knows, yeah, the safety messages get to employees. They've got all these pocket cards they've got to fill in and, and systems. And yeah, it's happening. Look at oh, the safety meetings. But it's not integrated. Integration means uh, the, the, the middle manager drives it him or herself. So here's my example of a guy I talked to at a mine site in South Africa. And so I sat down with his mine captain, a mine superintendent. And I said to him, so, and I, I was at his section underground that morning, it's a coal mine. 
I sat down with him in the afternoon. I said to him, so how often do you get to, to your team? And his answer shocked me at first. He said, as little as possible. And I said, what do you mean? You, you, don't you think that you should be out there? I mean, he says, if I am out there every day making the job happen, I am disempowering my people. I am not leaving them uh, with the authority and the, 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 the trust to do the job that they are well capable of doing. If they need me, I'll be there. But other than that, I'm here to look after things that they don't have to look after. Now, just think about that, you know, in terms of what is this, what is this person doing? He is empowering his people. He's trusting them. And he's creating a work environment where they can flourish in by being there as little as possible, which is quite the different angle if you think about it, how we normally see leaders. You've got to be out there. You've got to be kicking the tires. and You've got to be looking at, well, no, maybe that's not your job, <laughs> you know? Uh, so that to me is integration at a line level. That system, one system of safety, one system of operations, all managed by that middle manager. That is homegrown uh, in, in so many ways, if, if, if that's the objective of homegrown. Okay, uh, I took advantage, so I wrote some stuff down to sort of uh, coordinate my thoughts. So I know I've got six main points I'm going to share. So this is for the EHS professionals, smaller organization. The first thing is you've got to understand it's a long game, okay? You don't change culture in a year, in two years, in three years, right? You start to transform. But secondly, very often, your senior management, they understand lost time. Lost time equals away, people away from work. So you've got to look at your trend analysis and you've got to focus on that because you can't turn around and say, well, our accidents are, uh, uh, rates are very, very high because we're working on culture. You need to address that. So you need to look at your trends, whether it's slips, trips and falls, whether it's um, manual handling or whatever, and make sure you've got programs to drive them. On top of that, you've got to identify where you can kill somebody. We can have a fatal accident or an irreversible accident, and you've got to put those programs in place. That's your job as a, as a health and safety professional, whether it's a, a small to medium enterprise or whether it's a large organization. After that, you need to have a vision and a strategy that will evolve you to wherever you want to go over time. In our case, it's a hybrid of the DuPont Bradley curve, and you need to be honest of where you are. If you're in re reactive mode, if your line management are not involved, then you need to be honest with yourself and say, we're not at this stage yet, we're here. Because that will allow you to identify the tools that will work for you with respect to where your culture is. You need also to be able to, and this is something I've learned after many years, you need to adapt your language and the way you talk as a function of the person in front of you. So maybe you don't talk to the CEO as you would do to a line manager or to the financial person or to the HR person. You need to really put yourself in their shoes and understand what are they expecting and how do you embark them, like Corey was mentioning about the CFO. How do you get them on board? And you're not seen as the rigid safety guy that's just trying to drive the safety thing. He's blind. We're going to do it this way. You're flexible, you're adaptable, you understand the situation, and you can create a win-win situation that moves the needle a little bit, the hummingbird approach again. And then finally, 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 and I'm going to repeat myself on this one because it's important, do not forget that the fundamentals of risk management need to be in place. And your first responsibility is making sure you don't kill somebody, you don't have an irreversible accident, or anything like that. That is what you've got to get under control. That's what I would say to those young professionals, those professionals in SMEs. If you're going to focus, focus on those six or seven things. Great. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm going to, I'm going to throw in another question just along the same lines. Um, again, a little, little off script, but, uh, and, and I think we'll, we'll maybe dig into it a little bit um, in, the, in the next set of questions as well. But what if, what if we're trying to, 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 to transform the industry, the, the health and safety industry. You guys talked a little bit about, you know, maybe we should be called risk uh, officers, not safety officers, as an example. How would we go about, you know, if Safepedia 
you know, wants, <clears throat> you know, wants to, to help transform the community. I know Corey's, you know, very active in trying to transform the community. What, what would be some suggestions as safety professionals outside of our organizations, um, you know, that we could do to help, help transform the, the industry, not just our, our, our organizations? Is that for me, me or is that for Corey? Yeah, sorry. Malcolm, why don't you start? I can see you thinking up some good ideas there. Uh, Corey can make notes so he could, he could do yeah. a good play after this. <laughs> so you know, within, within L'Oreal, we're talking about being future fit, right? And we've identified, we've, we've crystal ball stuff, I know, but we've identified what future fit means. And it means we want EHS professionals that have more of a vision of where they want to go, but the organization needs to go as well. We, we need them to have better management, communication, and leadership skills. Because very often we found that the EHS professional is forgotten when it comes to leadership, management, communication still, skills by organizations. They either do it themselves as part of continuous professional development, or, it's, or it just doesn't happen, or it happens naturally, maybe. So we're, we're putting in place um, uh, proper leadership training for our EHS professionals worldwide, depending on what level they are, to try and get them ready for the future, the, the future ways of working, the future world, which is going to be more and more well-being. Mental health is going to come into this as well. Um, there need to be better coaches when, when it comes to coaching line managers, CFO, uh, 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 as Corey said. But they also need to be able to deliver effective and efficient training. The, the days of the past of the engineer that wrote 500 words on a slide and he read every single word have gone. The, our, our engineers have transformed, our people have transformed and they will continue to transform. But we, we need to make the messages simpler, but also targeted to the audience that we're trying to train, whether it be a line manager, operator, a uh, cleaner or a CFO. Maybe the presentation mode needs to be thought about. And then finally... And still important, going back to the foundation, we still have to re keep the expertise where expertise is required. We cannot offload, give everything to the line management. I mean, some areas of expertise, I'm a great believer, need to be kept within health, safety, and well-being uh, as a function. One of those, for example, is HAZOPS, process safety. Those kind of really hardcore stuff need to be kept. And we need to keep that expertise. We need to keep that expertise. So there you are. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I think um, what what Malcolm is is touching upon there is, um, it goes back to what do we define as safe in an organization? You know, what do we de define as safe in an industry? And there's so many different angles on that that determines what safety professional is uh, is going to do. Um, if if we define safe as compliance. In a broader sense, the safety professional is going to be a compliance officer. Um, if we define that person as a risk as expert, then it's going to be uh, focusing on risk practices and processes. So which one is it? And um, can we actually have a, a, a more converged uh, definition of safety in the industry? That's the real question. And I kind of think that's not going to be possible for, for a long time to come. Uh, organizations are going to define it in their own ways. Uh, gurus are going to define it in their way, which what they want to sell. Um, and, uh, and, and then there's also all kinds of institutions, government uh, institutions. In that we're all at various stages of this, in this maturity curve. But not only at various stages in the maturity curve, we're at various angles of defining ourselves. And uh, so for me, uh, you know, what would I see as the ideal, what I, role I think, uh, say, Safeopedia can, can contribute to is I really think that uh, the best way forward is to drive the focus on the risk in the organization, the, the, in, in the industry, everywhere. Uh, if we start with that uh, point, and I made the point about safety is the readiness to respond to risk, um, you can, you, then you have the capability to, to put various uh, pockets of expertise into place. The line manager uh, is the person who drives that operational process. But as Malcolm said, they need expertise around them. 
where is that expertise then to be? Um, the expertise need to be in 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 in, in uh, uh, excellence centers. Is some, some way that uh, some organizations uh, put this on. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a center of excellence. And so you can tap into that in your organization. So I need this kind of expertise. Come to my site or give me the tools, techniques. I'll do it, etc. Uh, so what I see is a gradual shift away from safety practitioners on the site running around doing audits and doing assessments and so on to them being pulled out of the site, uh, out of the reporting lines, and they have their capabilities available to uh, to the organization that they that they serve. Not only in this organization, also industries. All industries, I think, can go that way and should go that way. So that we all, I almost see, okay, so where does the safety professional uh, report to in the organization? Uh, well, they report at executive level. That's where they should be centered at and that's where they should be in the long term, I think, operate from. So uh, what is the role of the safety professional on the site? Um, I think there is still a role in the future because we, we, we are going to go increasingly into regulation. Uh, we're not moving away from regulation. You see how the European Union, how industry uh, legislation goes. There is going to be more uh, regulation. So my thinking is, well, maybe we should split the function. We should split the function into compliance issues, permitting. That's the, the level of administration of SAFE. But then there's the, the, the expertise in the organization that should drive that thinking into the next level of maturity, into the next level of expertise, into the next level of systems, and create progress, create advancement uh, as, as a separate function in the organization and in the industry. That's how I see it happen. I think we, we would, uh, I would concur um, on, on most of that, especially about the ideas of the center of excellence taking rather than having big corporates and all the rest of it, having more the expertise in the sites, in your regions or whatever, and finding a global expert, say in a, I could be say in um, South Africa, and that global expert could be on process safety management or another subject, lockout, tagout, and they become the global or the regional expert, right? And you can, and you can drive it down more because, um, you know, there's a war of talent out there as well, and it's important that we have the resources in the right place where it matters, which is making a difference on the shop floor, making a difference in the factories, in the warehouses, in the research places, etc. So, I, I I think we're 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 aligned with uh, with what Corey said. I would just add one thing, and slightly maybe where we disagree, and maybe disagreeing at the end is not a bad thing. A little bit, <laughs> not slightly disagreeing, but you know, I think it's fine having all the expertise. But if we allow that to take us back to the old school way of delivering training, lack of management skills, leadership skills, et cetera, I think that would be a disaster for the profession. So I think we, you know, I think being a health and, safe, a health and safety profession is one of the, the most difficult positions ever because one day you're talking to CEO, then you're talking to a contractor, then you're talking to a line manager, then a plant manager. You need to be have diverse leadership skills. And I think we need, and it's one of the, the best, I think, more, complete leadership functions unrecognized that, that there is in any organization. And I think it's important to give them the leadership, the management the communication skills. Otherwise they can't deliver the expertise properly. They won't be able to communicate it. They won't be able to do good training, interesting training. So I, I think we need to find that right balance, Corey, because I agree with you. We need to, we, if we're going to protect people from dying and from serious accidents and even and other types of accidents, we need to maintain the expertise, right? But the line Absolutely. management need to drive the management bit, right? But yeah. we need to be able to help that transformation. It's going to be interesting in the future. Yeah, but just on a very practical level, uh, one of the great outcomes of the pandemic is that uh, we can actually do this kind of engagement from anywhere in the world with sites around the world. And we actually facilitating processes now with our clients just purely on, on virtual platforms, uh, which meant we had to adapt uh, the way we do things, but there's a huge opportunity for us, not us mean safe map, but us in the safety and risk profession to actually do this much more in a in a in a in a in a, in a, in a hybrid way. Yeah. No, totally, yeah. totally agree. <clears throat> well, Corey, um, 
There's a lot of talk about the transformation from safety one to, to safety two. Um, we touched on a little bit earlier, but how helpful are these labels? And, and you know, what is deep safe and why is it different than, than say safety two? Um, it, it is probably um, it's in some ways different. Uh, in some ways, it's the same. Um, I really started working in uh, South Africa in this organization. And uh, one of my first, uh, I was first human resource manager. I was a psychologist and then we went into safety. Um, I facilitated at 60 mines in South Africa with my friend Eric Rachikopa. Uh, we facilitated an EOF process, uh, elimination of fatalities process, but it was uh, a process that we redeveloped and looked at human and organizational performance, HOP um, uh, processes. And so we had a management team on site. We did uh, cultural surveys beforehand, uh, and we would have worker engagement teams uh, working to, uh, coming together and uh, learning teams, and they would present to management during this week. It was a week-long process. It was a HOP process. This is in 1986. So, you know, I can't say that, uh, you know, that Safety 2 uh, is new. Uh, I, I really don't think it is. Um, it's been around the concepts of employee participation. I mean, uh, the Japanese and, and Deming knew that 50 years ago. Uh, employee engagement, you know, it's like, it's like not, and I, you see on LinkedIn every, every other week, somebody posting, humans are not the problem, they're the solution. Uh, humans, uh, humans, uh, human error is a result of people reacting, reacting to their systems. That is not new stuff. It is old, old stuff. And so what is safety one, safety two, safety, you know, I, I, I really don't like these labels because they mean nothing. And there's a lot of hype and hot air around it. Uh, the new view, uh, a so-called new view. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot of talk. I would like to see uh, a lot more substance of what happens on the ground in this kind of thinking, uh, and uh, you know, and, and um, you know, there's a, if you've been following uh, um, LinkedIn, there's a lot of uh, to and fro between some some people uh, on, uh, on, and I'll name him Don Cooper. I really love this paper that he published around the emperor has no clothes on, uh, because he made the point very strongly that um, there's 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 so much talk here, there's not enough substance in this whole process, so. Uh, so that's the one thing about, you know, I, I am labeled as safety too, uh, but I, I've never been doing anything different since the start of my career. So that's the one thing about it. So, but I do believe this, uh, there is something beyond, um, beyond that, that, that lies beyond for us. And, and, and maybe that is system, that is safety three. Uh, and I know uh, there's some, uh, some thinking about that or, or labeling around that happening. Uh, but that's what I label as deep safe. So what is deep safe? Um, it is dynamic risk systems that the, the system is, is, is available to the client and the client uses this and adapts this and, and, and tailor this into its own uh, operational efficiencies and its own operational design. Um, the other area that we focus a lot on in deep safe is risk competence, uh, making people smarter in risk making people more competent to see and take risk. And I, and I know when I say take risk, there's immediate red flags. Well, the, the, the taking of a risk is fundamental to anything we do. Every aspect of our lives is taking risk. So why we constantly tell people to avoid risk or to control risk, I think is, is not all that helpful. How we make them smart to do that um, is, 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 a, is a powerful process. And then... Uh, the, 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 the metrics that I talked about, the indicators, you know, this is an, an area that we help the, the, the clients to, uh, to assess themselves, to analyze themselves, and to develop and evolve their own processes from that. That is a, a very uh, important and, uh, a process. Um, I think the other thing that, that, that we, uh, and this is a, a more recent development for us, is we enable organizations to challenge themselves. And I mentioned the Netflix idea of employing hackers in the organization. 
uh, Simeon Army. Uh, so we've developed that into a safety process. And we just call that for fancy reasons. We call that Delta, Deep Elimination of Latent Triggers of Accidents. So we train for, in the organization a, a number of small teams, two or three people form a team, a blue team, red team, yellow team, etc. They've got different uh, focus areas. And these teams form randomly under the name, under the command of a commander, and they do a strike, a delta strike. They go into an area, they talk to a manager, and they do a blue strike. What are the blue sky risks in this environment that they have to deal with, as an example? So they challenge themselves, and the system is completely self-sufficient, self-sustaining, um, but they actually make sure their system is constantly challenged and, 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 and improved. That is what I mean with deep safe. You actually look at your, how you regenerate yourself all the time. And, uh, and the area that, that Malcolm also mentioned a few times, for me, the ultimate focus for us is the elimination of fatal and serious accidents. So we do a lot of work in that field, elimination of fatal accidents through a range of processes that the organization, again, uh, integrates into its uh, own operations and its own systems. So in a nutshell, that's, that, that's how I think, uh, you know, deep safe and uh, 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 operates, but how we, how we, I don't like the label safe, safety two or any label for that matter. Well, you've got us you, just kind of in closing here, you know, you've got us all inspired and all, all fired up and, uh, you know, Malcolm, if we start with, with you, like if, if, if we transform, if we follow some of the guidelines you guys have provided today and we do it effectively at a fundamental level within our organization, are, are we going to be ready for, for the future? I, I don't know. I mean, uh, it's, it's the honest answer because we were not ready for the pandemic. huh? You know, I mean, uh, there was people that predicted something like that would happen. But I mean, what we can do is create the solid foundations of an organization. And this is to use some of the buzzwords, but that's agile, right? So systems that are agile, systems that are not only resilient, but are learning as a result of, of, of what happens, like learning from the COVID. Um, and I think the only way we can do that is we need to have a solid foundation, which is going back to the, uh, the risk foundation. We need to know where we're going, but we need to also understand that what we talk about very often is the world is, is VUCA, okay? So the world is volatile, it's, it's uncertain, it's complex, and it's ambiguous, right? And somehow we've got to accept that is going to be the case, it's going to be more the case in the future. We've got to be able to operate in that world. And we've mentioned before in um, Corey in, in, other, in other sessions sort of, I, I like this idea that is done by some, and I, I adhere to a flip in VUCA, and VUCA to give vision, understanding, clarity, and also, we, we, I'd like to say, be ambitious, right, with respect to where you're going, to give you that light at the end of the tunnel, because that gives you the flexibility and the resilience that you, and the adaptability that you need maybe in the future, right? But you still need, at the end of the day, to have your foundation solid. You need to have know where you're going, whether it's using a hybrid Brad, um, Bradley Curve like L'Oreal does or whether it's a different system that, that comes in from somebody else, you need to know where you're going and you need to be on that transformation journey to come back to, to, to Deming's 14th principle. It is important and transformation happens by design, right? And, it, and you just need to be there. So yeah, are we ready for the future? Not necessarily. Are we ready for the future? Maybe. I like, I like, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I think uh, to, 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 take, to take what Malcolm said uh, on, on another angle um, uh, is, you know, we, we, we cannot, um, we, we have to create that future um, with what we do, etc. And the, 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 the kicker for me is that uh, it starts every single day. Uh, you know, when you wake up in the morning, the organization, all the individual, all the team, uh, not much of what you've done yesterday 
um, is going to spill into today for you and safeguard you today. You have to re regenerate whatever you've done uh, or you are, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's going to falter and fail. And so the same with in the long term. Um, I think we have to constantly for work on that creation process that, uh, that, that Malcolm says, you know, which to me, you also use the other word, um, starts with a vision. Um, and, I, and, and I hate this thing about vision statements and revisioning because uh, it becomes such a label and becomes such another um, uh, 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 process in an organization that people put posters on walls and it looks fancy. But the vision that lives in the minds of people, why my organization wants to be safe. What, however, they 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 they, uh, they 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 populate that term, and that's what we did in this uh, process that we did with uh, this company. I would first thing I would ask an employee is, why does your organization want to be safe? And it, 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 the answers you get from that is so varied, but it tells you the organization is either on its way somewhere, or it's not. It's into it. it it's going to create a future. And so I, I think that the, uh, the, the, the whole focus on, uh, you know, the future with the rapid changes that's coming around now uh, in terms of, you know, digital eras and, and, and all these new things that uh, we probably will, will, will won't even see in 2050, um, maybe it's going to be so vastly different that not much of what we're doing today will, will even be valid, uh, relevant in that circumstance. So it is a continuous day-to-day -day process. It's, it's a continuous evolution all the time, I think. Great, well, it's been an absolute pleasure and privilege to have you both on today. And uh, I always enjoy the conversation and a lot of, a lot of great takeaways for everyone. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have Corey and Malcolm's contact information. I think you can connect with them on, on LinkedIn and. Um, I don't think either of them mind if you reach out with any follow-up questions. Um, I know they're, they're huge uh, contributors to the community. So, so thank you, Malcolm and, and Corey. Uh, it was, a, like I say, a true pleasure today. Thank you very much. My pleasure also. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thanks for great, uh, great questions.